Hi folks, and welcome to another episode of Life Under Tampa Bay. I'm Bill Arnold, and I'm your host. And obviously today we're doing things a little bit differently. We're out of the studio and in the field at the Florida Marine Research Institute, uh, Bureau of the Department of Environmental Protection. And we're gonna go inside today and talk to some of our scientists about how they go about aging and determining the growth rate of fish species in Florida. This is important information applicable in both the biological and a management sense. Uh, we use it biologically to determine how different populations grow, age, and die. And we use it from a management point of view to determine what management efforts or regulations we can employ to alter the uh, growth, not the growth rate, but the growth pattern, the overall age structure of these populations. And that determines not just how many fish are out there, but how old they are. Of course, younger fish grow faster than older fish, so how fast they're growing as a population, and also at what rate they're reproducing, because the older fish tend to be the more reproductively active fish. And it's very important to us to maintain healthy, reproductively viable fish populations, because that's how we reproduce populations from year to year, maintain large numbers of fish out there, and maintain fishable stocks so that the recreational fishermen can get their catch. And so any commercial fishermen that may be working the area can also be able to obtain fish for the uh, open market. Okay, we're in the Otolith Extraction Laboratory at FMRI with Kathy Tisdall and Julie Wallen. And they're going to show us how exactly they extract the otoliths from the head of the fish for processing for age analysis. Kathy, why don't you tell us a little bit about this process? Okay, well, once we're out, when we're out in the field and we actually collect the fish, there are certain species which the Institute does stock assessments for. Okay. And today we'll be working on a sheep's head. We also do such species as snook and redfish and spotted sea trout. But once we actually collect the fish, each fish gets a label. And on that label, we can write down the information of exactly where we caught the fish, when it was caught, so that we can keep track of the age and length data for the different species and, and can track that information back to their exact location, such as what, what type of habitat are they in, are they adults, are they juveniles, are they males, are they females, and how old are they? Okay. Uh, how many fish do you generally collect and process to be able to develop valid age growth estimations? Well, our data, when we are out sampling, our data ranges we may bring back in a day anywhere between, gosh, I don't know, 40 and 100 fish. Wow. It depends on which species we're after. Um, I don't know what, how many would make a... But you generally process most or all of the fish that you bring back. We usually take a sample. Okay. Um, for instance, some of the species which are of more of a recreational interest as well as the commercial interest will subsample. If we catch less than 10, we'll bring them back. If we actually catch more than 10 in our nets, we'll, we'll just take the, record the length information, identify the species, and then release them alive. Okay. Just bring so there's a tremendous volume of fish going through this laboratory, yes. keeping <laughs> everybody very quality. busy. <laughs> I'm sure there is. Do you want to show us exactly how you pull the otolith okay. out of the sheep's head? Sure. Okay, okay Kathy, you're going to process this sheep's head. Uh, what is the first step in uh, d extracting the otolith? Okay, the first thing I'll do is give all the data information from the field to the data recorder so that we can keep track of all the information for the specific fish. Okay, and today that's Julie. All right. All right. Okay, the collection number was TBM970609, and it was a saying that we did on July 8, 1997. Okay, okay now we'll, we'll weigh the fish to get a total weight on it. Nine hundred forty seven point one. Nine hundred forty seven point one grams? Grams. Yes. It's all metric units here. And then the standard length of the fish is two hundred and eighty six millimeters. Okay, now we'll just go ahead and you extract the otoliths. Kathy, how do you know where to cut on the fish to extract the otolith? Well, for each species it's a little bit different, but the, the otoliths are always in the brain case, so you're always working at the head of the fish. And for this particular species, I'll start the incision right at the front of the dorsal fin, which is the fin on the back of the fish, uh -huh. cut down until I can sort of feel that I've hit bone. 
And then I'll make a horizontal incision starting at the top of the eye and coming over to complete the triangle. Okay, once the incision is actually made, then you just remove the piece of flesh, expose the brain right here, and then you'll have to actually remove the brain from the fish because the otoliths are going to be underneath it inside a little bony cavity. And depending on the fish, it can take a little bit of search time. But hopefully, I'm close to being on the mark today. Okay. okay, I can actually see the two otoliths, so my cut was pretty good today. There's one. And the second otolith is right there. Hold that up to the camera, please, Kathy, so that our viewers can see it. Okay, can you get a shot of that? Put it against the dark of the fish. Maybe that'll help. It's almost transparent, but it certainly is small. Yeah, it is. They're, they're very small in this particular species. Okay, Julie, I see that Kathy has now removed the otolith and cleansed it, and she's working on a more general dissection of the fish. What is she up to? Okay, what Kathy's going to do now is dissect the fish and determine what sex it is. She'll be um, removing the gonads from the fish and weighing them. Uh -huh. And we use that information to determine the reproductive condition of those fish. And when we get the information from a large number of um, fish, we get information then on the trends in the reproductive processes of these fish in the wild. So we have an idea of what times of year they spawn, how frequently they spawn, how many eggs they produce and um, what their reproductive output is. And I assume this is very important from a management perspective as to how you actually handle these fish populations and determine regulations to control their abundance and their uh, harvest rate. That's right. It's very important to know um, how, how frequently and how mu much these fish are reproducing. That gives us an index of how many fish are being recruited into the population and can replace fish that fishermen might be removing or that are dying of natural mortality. Okay. Kathy, I see that you're, you're gutting this fish essentially as a fisherman would. What are you going to find in there, and, and what information will it provide? Okay, well, the first thing you do is, just like you said, like a fisherman would, I just make a cut along the stomach of the fish. I'm going to sort of make a little window, a little flap of skin that I can pull back, which will expose basically the stomach and the intestines and the gonads of the fish. Not a simple procedure. <laughs> well, it's pretty simple. It's a matter of just keeping your fingers out of the way. Now you're extracting the gonad from this fish, Kathy? Right. I've already removed the intestines and some of the extra fatty tissue. Now I just have to cut out the gonads at both ends. And you can see here they are. Well, they're a lot smaller than I thought they would be. <laughs> yeah, they are very small. This is This looks like an immature female. And... It change, yeah, depending on the time of year, it'll vary. And the, the size and the color and the shape. And now we'll actually weigh them. So. That's 0.7. Well, we've seen them extract the gonad from the sheep's head and determine sex and reproductive status. And they've also extracted the otolith or ear bones for age and growth analysis. Our next step will be to move down to the age growth uh, analytical laboratory and we'll, we'll observe them embedding and sectioning the otolith for analysis. Now we've extracted the otolith and dried it in preparation for mounting. We're in the mounting lab, the embedding lab for otoliths. I'm with Heather Patterson. She's our, one of our otolith experts and she's going to show us exactly how they go about mounting it and cutting it in preparation for reading. Heather, how are you doing today? I'm fine, Bill. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> okay, Heather, why don't you take us through the steps involved in embedding and sectioning an otolith for a fish? Okay, well, the first thing we do is we make up all the slides we'll need for the otolith. Then we take the otolith and we mark with a pencil where the core is going to be or about where the core is going to be. The core being the center part of the otolith where the rings form from, like looking dead center at a tree stump or something to count the rings around it. Once we do that, we heat up a slide on this hot plate, and we use this material called thermoplastic, um, which is like a resin, uh, to glue the otolith onto the slide. So we melt it on the hot plate, and then we can very easily manipulate the material. OK, and then you can just manipulate it. It dries very quickly, cools down very quickly. 
and there it is all ready to be sectioned. Okay, Heather, you now have the otolith securely fastened to the slide, and I guess you want to section the otolith so we can get at the inside of it. What mm -hmm. are the steps involved in this process? Well, we use these special saws that um, have diamond tip blades, um, like a jeweler saw. And what we do first is we have our otolith that's all mounted, and it just fits into this little slot right here. So we just get it in there nice and straight and secure. Um, then what we want to do is we have adjusted the weight and speed accordingly. Each type of otolith, we know how much weight we can use, what speed we can use, etc. Then what we do is we take our pencil mark where we marked the core before, we line it up with the saw blade so that we know where we are. And we just start the saw and we let it make its cut. And we usually make five sections so we'll get four actual otolith sections to look at. So when we look at these, we have a, a good selection of slides to look at. So you'll be cutting four thin sections out of this otolith? Mm -hmm. Each section's about 500 microns, the way we normally do it. Or about a half a millimeter in thickness. Mm -hmm. Correct. Heather, you cut these sections at a half of a millimeter thickness. Why do you cut them so thin? Well, we cut them that thin so that when we put them on the slide, light can pass through them, and that way we can count the rings effectively. If they're too thick, you can't see the rings very well. Okay. I also notice that the saw blade is running through a reservoir of liquid. What is that liquid, and what is its purpose? That is a glycerin solution, and it lubricates the saw. The saws can't run dry, or we don't get good sections. Okay. Heather, now that you've cut the sections out of the otolith, how do you recover them and further treat them? Okay, well, once we've cut all the sections, this little tray here just slips right out. And there's a little grated basket in there that catches the sections from falling in there too far. And you just pull it up and pick out the otolith sections. And then they're then placed in a 95% ethyl alcohol solution to rinse off the glycerin so they're not all coated. And then they're just quickly dried on a paper towel and then placed on the slide that they'll finally be glued to. And I guess that slide is pre-labeled as to the specimen number. Mm -hmm. We keep close track of which specimen number it's from so that samples don't get switched around. Well, to permanent, permanently mount the otoliths on the slide, uh, we use a mounting medium called Histamount, which will basically glue the otoliths onto the slide, but it also acts um, to improve the look they'll have under the microscope, fills in the cracks, makes them very easy to see, etc. And it's this very viscous sort of material that we just sort of slop on there and covers them. And once we get to this stage, they dry for about 10 days, and then they are ready to be read. So this isn't necessarily a rapid turnaround type procedure? Um, not necessarily. You can read them when they're wet, but that can prove to be messy. <laughs> so this doesn't necessarily seem like a real rapid process. How long does it take from otolith extraction until it's ready to be read? Well, if someone wanted to read it really quickly and wanted a nice dry otolith, we could probably do it in about a week rush, but generally the turnover is a month or two. Okay. And this is what the final product will look like when it's completed. Good. Thanks, Heather. Mm -hmm. Sure, no problem. Now that we've extracted the otoliths and embedded and polished them, we're ready to actually look at them through the microscope and determine how many growth lines are in each otolith. For this exercise. We're working with Tim McDonald in our image analysis room and he's going to give us an explanation of exactly how he goes about extracting information from the sheep head otolith. Tim, take it away. After the uh, otolith has been sectioned, it's mounted on a slide. You put the slide underneath the dissecting microscope. The image is captured by a video uh, imagery system here, transferred through the computer onto the uh, TV screen on my far right here. Then with it on the TV screen, you can actually count the number of rings uh, or annuli that are on the, the otolith. Um, otoliths are just like tree rings. Every year, another ring is laid down. So by counting the number of rings on this otolith, we can tell how old this fish is. During the course of the year, um, there are fast-growing stages and slow-growing stages within each fish. And these sh are show up in the bone structure as opaque and translucent uh, bands. 
So each translucent band, a uh, combination of a translucent and opaque band make up a year. You can see here, this is fairly translucent. You can see through it. And then there's an opaque, a uh, darker band here. That makes up one year's worth of, uh, uh, of growth. And then you can see another translucent, another opaque, another translucent, another opaque, and so on for the, the, age, for the total age of the fish. Tim, I have a couple of questions, the first of which is, how do you know that these rings are actually annual in nature? Well, there's two ways that you can tell that. Um, the, the first way and the surest way is that you can mark these otoliths. So you uh, inject the fish with tetracycline, and that puts a, a, uh, a mark on here that you can see under ultraviolet light. And then you can put, release the fish back into a controlled situation where you can harvest them again in, say, another year, year and a half. And then you can count the number of rings that have been laid down since that tetracycline injection was given. And then you can look at the number of days since he was put back, since the injection, and tell how old, or, and verify that it's actually an annual ring. All right, Tim, that's one way of verifying the annual nature of these bands. Uh, what's the other method that you use? The second method is called marginal increment analysis. And what you do there is you can see that there's a set distance. It's fairly consistent between the uh, opaque and the translucent rings. And you can actually, what this software does is it measures the distance and by taking the percentage of the distance that's been completed you can tell how far along in the year that annual eye is towards being completed so uh, you can compare that this one took say five millimeters and this one took five millimeters if this one was only four millimeters you could do a percentage and say that okay that's only uh, 11 months into the formation of that ring okay tim during which season is the opaque ring laid down and during which season is the translucent ring laid down and why as I said earlier, they are laid down during a fast-growing season and a slow-growing season. For uh, sheep's head, they, they lay down the opaque ring during the fast-growing season, which is the spring, which would be the uh, time frame from February to May in Florida waters. And they lay down the uh, translucent rings during the rest of the, uh, the growing season. Okay. So they're actually growing more slowly during most of the year, and there's only a short period of rapid growth. That's correct. So they do most of their growing in like a quarter of the entire year. That's, yes. <laughs> wow. Tim, how precisely can you age these animals from year to year? You can age them very precisely, but what we're trying to get at with doing the ages is to get to an age length key where we can look at a fish and measure it until the age based upon its, its length. Um, with sheep's head, just like with humans, there are all sorts of size ranges. You have short people, you have tall people. You have big sheep's head, you have little sheep's head. And uh, sheep's head are particularly bad with this, where size is not a very good indicator of age. So we have to continually extract otoliths in order to age fish and create age length keys for each year. So the, to solve the problem with lack of precision, you collect larger sample sizes? Yes, we do. Uh, with sheep's head, we try to collect about 400 fish from the Tampa Bay area every year. And we're also collecting from other bay systems. Now, I assume that other fish species may provide a more precise estimate of a, a length age relationships. And with those species, do you collect fewer samples to get the same reliability in your estimates? Yes, you can. You can collect a, less, a much smaller sample size with fish that you're much more confident with the, uh, the age length keys on. All right. Thanks, Tim. OK, now we've extracted the otoliths, embedded them, sectioned them, polished them, and read them to get actual data from the otolith. Now let's go see what we do with that data after we've extracted it. Now we're with Dr. Gary Nelson working on the computer, and we're going to discuss exactly how we take the data that we have collected and apply it in a management or biological situation. Gary, why don't you tell us a little bit about this? OK, Bill. Um, one of the reasons we take uh, otoliths from fish is to be able to age, age those fish. Yeah. And the information we get from those readings of individual fish is an estimate of uh, the age structure of a population. In a population, just like, like humans, that entire uh, population is made up of different age individuals. Each individual of the different ages may have different rates of reproduction, of uh, mortality. And to be able to um, manage a, a, po a population um, effectively, we need to be able to determine those rates and how um, they change over time and with, with age and also size and, and things like that. And that's important because if um, fishing is too high on particular age classes, particularly ones that produce um, the largest number of, of young, 
that's going to have a severe impact on what the population in the future is going to be like, whether there's going to be enough out there to sustain the population, and also whether there will be enough fish out there for fishermen to catch. And I guess this varies not only among individuals within a population, but also among populations around the state within a species, and then again among the different species of harvested and unharvested but biologically important fish that occur in Florida. That's, that's correct. Um, because bays are different, um, in Florida, for instance, this is a very large uh, state. Um, there are latitudinal differences in all these rates um, because of temperature. A lot of uh, physiological functions of fishes are affected by temperature, and some fish may grow slower up north than down south. And so you can't really manage um, the entire population of, say, like, of snook, for instance, um, based on the analysis of one population because things may change from location to location and so we actually need to be sampling a lot of different areas to get the correct information. Okay, can you show us some examples of this on your computer? Yes. All right, Gary, we have an example of some fish otolith age growth type information on the computer screen here. Why don't you explain this to us and discuss a little bit about its applications? Okay, Bill, one thing you can do with uh, samples of fishes once you age them is to graph the number of individuals um, against their ages, and you can get an, an idea of what the age structure of that population is like. In this example, what I've done was just plot the age structure of a population that's not harvested, and it, this is just a hypothetical population. Okay. Um, and what's shown here is... Uh, after this line are those individuals or those ages that would actually be reproducing and bringing more individuals into the population. So that's the information you obtain from doing the gonadal analysis. That's right. That's right. You can get an estimate uh, from that of um, which individuals and which ages are actually reproducing or make up that what we call the spawning stock biomass. Okay. Um, what can happen? This example you'll see it's a very um, nice curve, and it's this population is not harvested. But let's uh, show you uh, an example that uh, would happen if um, fish were harvested. You know, one, one of the interesting uh, things about fishing is people like to catch big fish. Right. And those big fish tend to be either large and also old because it, it takes a long time for them to grow up. Uh, what I've shown in this, this graph is just a hypothetical example of what could happen when we only uh, harvest those large and old individuals. And you can see here it's a, a diff much different age structure than that previous example. Far fewer large reproducing fish on this example. Exactly. And that, that's the problem with uh, fishing sometimes is we're taking out so much spawning stock biomass that there's very little to uh, maintain the population. And that, that's when we get a decline. As a friend of mine once said, uh, you can't have if you don't have mothers, you can't have babies, and if, um, particularly if you're removing those large individuals that reproduce and, and uh, produce the most young. So the fact that you may have a lot of young may mislead you into thinking you have a healthy population, but the real key is up here in the reproducing area. That's right, that's right. Okay, Gary, when we detect a, a problem such as this with a fish, fish population, when there's just too few reproducing adults, what are some strategies that we can implement to try to relieve this problem? Well, basically, there are two things we can do. One is to con try to control effort, basically set a bag limit on how many fish uh, an individual can take. Okay. And also, you can do things like uh, seasonal closures. Um, people are only allowed to fish certain times of the year. Um, those work very effectively because if somebody is fishing during that time of year and taking fish, you can actually catch them doing it because right. they're, they're out there fishing. Um, bag limits a little more difficult, um, except when Marine Patrol officers uh, are able to stop somebody. It's uh, basically an honor system, but that's one way of doing it. Honor and respect for the resource. And I guess redfish would be a good example of this. Yeah, it's, uh, there's, uh, uh, yes, there's a big bag limit on uh, redfish, also snook. There's a right now. There's 24 inch um, uh, slot limit. Actually, it's called between 24 and 36 inches that you can keep a fish. Um, other than that, they all have to go back. Over. And the reason for protecting those larger fish is because they are the reproductively valuable animals. Exactly. Exactly. Those big uh, snook are, tend to be female. 
All right, Gary, thanks a lot. You're welcome. So that's aging growth in fish in Florida, and that's exactly how we go about the procedure here at the Florida Marine Research Institute in downtown St. Petersburg. If you have any more questions, please feel free to call our Education and Information Office at 896-8626. Until the next episode, see you later.